we've actually been talking about evolution for this entire course in one way or another, but today we're going to give it a formal treatment. I want to talk about the mechanisms by which viruses evolve and then talk briefly at the end of where we think viruses came from as a way of setting the stage for our next topic next week, which is emerging infections. Virus populations change constantly in the face of selection pressures. That's our definition of virus evolution. And there are a number of important concepts that drive evolution. First of all, the spectacular diversity of virus populations, which is one reason why they're so successful in adapting to new em environments. They make huge numbers of particles, the mutation rates are high, and whenever confronted with a pressure, an immune pressure or the pressure of a new host, they can change readily because within that diverse population, there's always a particle that is able to take advantage of the new conditions. So the sources of diversity that allow evolution are mutation, the high mutation rates, especially for RNA viruses as we've discussed, but DNA viruses also change, and recombination. Those two are sources of diversity, together with huge numbers of viruses that are made, enable viral evolution to take place. Essentially, if the virus population wasn't able to change or adapt to whatever the situation is at the moment, it would disappear. And then have no doubt been many, many examples of viruses that have come and go in the past. Very difficult for us to see this, of course. Uh, and it's simply because they weren't able to adapt to the changing conditions and couldn't replicate. Virology today, in fact, provides a wonderful window on the mechanisms of evolution. And before the studies of modern virology, I think a lot of people had difficulty with evolution, starting from Charles Darwin to the present. Basically, Virus populations are always selected to be able to infect host populations. There are new viral populations emerging every day. In the ocean, remember, there are 10 to the 21st lytic infections per second. Absolutely selection going on in the second time scale there and at other places as well. So virus populations are always changing. In addition, the viruses change the host. Virus populations can be selection forces in the evolution of host populations. If the host can't adapt to a lethal virus infection, I think it's quite clear that the population is going to be exterminated. And we know that host populations change. This is the so-called arms race. The virus change to overcome a host defense. The host evolves to change in turn, and it just goes back and forth public must understand evolution because viruses exemplify it. I think even if most people or many people do not believe in evolution, if you look at what viruses do, you have to believe it. We have new viral diseases like AIDS, West Nile virus in the US, hepatitis C virus, Ebola virus, which is in the news lately. These are all relatively new uh, additions to human infections. And they're there because of evolution. Every year, people get influenza and common colds and other infections, noroviruses. And these are all a product of evolving viral populations. Drug resistance, particularly for HIV, but for other viruses as well. All of these properties are features of viral evolution. And viruses evolve faster than we can really understand. Humans are used to gestation periods of months to years in animals, very slow evolution. Well, you can't see viruses and you can't appreciate the fact that they're evolving very quickly. And when we talk about virus evolution, we always define it in terms of a population of viruses, not an individual virus particle. And that's because, as you'll see in a few moments, virus populations are actually huge arrays of mutants that are again made at very, very high levels. All right, so a particle 
is not what is evolving, it's the population. We shouldn't think of individual virus particles as the average of a population. We have to study the population as a whole. This has become clear only in the last 20 years or so. Virus virologists are in fact population biologists, whether they know it or not. And let's first talk about the four, the four main drivers of virus evolution. Large numbers of progeny, which we've touched on many times. Large numbers of mutants or a high mutation rate. Quasi-species effects. That's a new term. We'll define that and discuss it. And finally, selection. These are the four main drivers of virus evolution. There's no question that you need to understand these and how they work. First, the fact that viruses make lots of progeny. This should come as no surprise to you. Here is a table showing uh, virus production for two human viruses, hepatitis B virus, human immunodeficiency virus. Uh, and let's take first the total production of virus in the blood, 10 to the 11th at any given time for hepatitis B, 10 to the 9th for HIV. The daily turnover, huge, 90% for HIV, 50% daily turnover. That means all the virus particles that are in the blood at any given time, half of them turn over or new ones are made in a day. Uh, the half-life of a virus particle for hep B, 24 hours, 6 hours for HIV. 50% of the particles are gone in 6 hours. And we also see in the infected cell similar uh, numbers, half-life a bit longer of course for hepatitis B virus, but two days in the infected cell for HIV, the turnover for HIV 30%. So just two examples of the huge numbers of particles uh, that are produced in the infected individual and that of course is an important component of evolution and that's what makes viruses different in terms of evolution because they make so many particles. Just think of how many offspring a human makes in its lifetime. It's not even comparable, not even the same order of magnitudes. In fact, they're orders of magnitude different compared to viruses. And this is a great area for evolution. In fact, we make lots of particles, excuse me, viruses make lots of particles. We have a host defense. That interface is where one of the places that selection and evolution occurs. You can only have evolution when mutations occur in a population. It wouldn't matter if you made billions and billions of virions every day. If they were all the same, genetically speaking, no evolution would occur. So mutations are essential, and these of course are produced during copying of the nucleic acid. That is where the vast majority of the fertile ground for evolution takes place. And you know that for RNA viruses, the RNA polymerases make mistakes, just like DNA polymerases do, but the RNA polymerases cannot correct the errors that they make. They make, on average, one in 10,000 or 100,000 mistakes. So for every 10,000 or 100,000 nucleotides polymerized during copying of a strand, you have one error. And that means in a 10 kilobase RNA virus genome, if the error rate is 1 in 10 to the 4, you would have about one mutation per genome. One mutation per new genome made, and there are hundreds of thousands of these in every infected cell. Just each cell. Consider many infected cells in an animal, and you can see the extent of the error frequency. DNA viruses, as we said before, are not as error prone as RNA viruses. They have proofreading mechanisms, which we discussed a bit last time, and because they are less error prone, DNA viruses generate less diverse diversity, they evolve more slowly, and they have a different lifestyle from most RNA viruses. They have a narrow host range typically compared to RNA viruses, and they frequently make persistent infections, and probably all of these are related to the lower mutation frequency. Now let's talk about the quasi-species concept as it applies to evolution. This all began back in 1978 with the publication of a paper in the journal Cell uh, called 
uh, analysis of an RNA bacteriophage population. So the bacteriophage used in this study was called Q-beta. It is a virus that infects bacteria. It was used as a model system to try and understand just how diverse a population of phages was. Up until this point, we didn't have any clue. We had very little ability to sequence uh, by 1978. And sequencing actually wasn't, even though it was in its infancy at the time, it wasn't really n the right approach to studying this question. How diverse is an RNA virus population? Because sequence gives you an average sequence of the population. And in this study, they used a, a method that could look a little deeper and understand how diverse an RNA virus population was. And what they found was, is shown here in this quote, a Q-beta phage population is in a dynamic equilibrium with viral mutants arising at a high rate on the one hand and being strongly selected against on the other. The genome of Q-beta cannot be described as a defined unique structure, but rather as a weighted average of a large number of different individual sequences. So the name of that paper was Nucleotide Sequence Heterogeneity of an RNA Phage Population. This the discovery was way ahead of its time. Most virologists, including myself, really didn't appreciate it. Nowadays, we are revisiting this with next generation sequencing methods where we can, in theory, sequence every RNA molecule in a virus preparation. And that is simply confirming these conclusions reached in 1978. So the key here is that virus populations are quasi-species. So the idea that is actually incorrect that a species is one sequence the virus is many sequences. A virus stock, if I hold up in front of you a tube of virus, that tube would contain viruses all with different nucleotide sequences. So that's why we say they exist as dynamic distributions of non-identical but related replicons. Dynamic because they're always changing. As you grow the virus, it would change. Uh, these are all related, but they're different. And replicon simply means that it can replicate. That's what a quasi-species is. So let's illustrate this graphically. On the left is a series of lines, each of which represents an RNA virus genome in a virus stock. It could be Q-beta or it could be poliovirus, doesn't matter. And the symbols, the lines, the circles, the stars, the triangles, etc., and each of those is a, a mutation which distinguishes each genome. You can see they're all different. In fact, no two of them are alike. The, if you took the average of all of these genomes, and again, every virus particle in the stock would be different. If you took the average, the sequence would come out at the bottom here. And, it, and you see that actually this sequence, which is a consensus of all the sequences above. This consensus sequence doesn't actually exist in the virus population. Yet, if you used older methods of sequencing nucleic acids, such as the ones that I use to sequence the poliovirus genome, so here on the right is the sequence of poliovirus RNA, 7,442 nucleotides long. Yes, that's the one that took me a year to determine. This is an average of the population because these sequencing methods that I use weren't sensitive enough to pick up a low percentage of this particular mutant in the population. So this sequencing method gives you the average, which is the line on the bottom. So virus stocks are quasi-species shown on the left. They are not sequences shown on the right as I determined for polio and in many other people determined for other viruses because those are averages. Those probably don't actually exist in the, in the virus population. So these uh, sequences that we used to define back then were really myths. They didn't actually exist. They were an average of what was present. So when viruses infect a cell, it's not a single sequence. And maybe up until this point in this course, you're thinking when a virus infects the cell, it's a specific virus with one sequence and that's it. Well, that couldn't be farther from the truth because infections are initiated by a population which have all different sequences. And what's made after a single round of infection 
is the product of selection in the host, and it may be different from what goes in. Similarly, the viruses that infect the new host are a product of the selective forces that act outside of the host. So that's what I mean by the myth of consensus genome sequences, the sequence I determined for polio and that many other individuals determined for other viruses are consensus sequences, but they don't exist for any given virus. The genome, in fact, clusters around a, a consensus or an average sequence, but every genome in the population can be different from an, any other one. And as I said earlier, it's unlikely that a genome with this consensus sequence is actually replicating in the population. So just remember that when you see a sequence of a virus genome and conclusions are made from it, those conclusions may not be correct because, in fact, that sequence is a consensus and doesn't certainly represent the dynamics that are occurring in a very diverse viral population. All right, so that is sequence diversity conferred by large numbers of progeny and high mutation rates. That is then acted upon by selection forces which produces evolution. And selection is what actually favors the creation of diversity and mutations that predominate. So this may be a bit counterintuitive, uh, but in fact, survival, as far as survival for a virus can be defined, results in diverse populations as well as selected mutations. So diversity is maintained, but also, of course, specific amino acid changes are important as well. And so one of the concepts that's important to know is survival of the fittest. That is a rare genome with a particular mutation may survive a selection event, and that mutation will be found in all progeny genomes. But it's the single mutation that is being selected for. The rest of the genome may not matter its particular collection of sequences, and so as a consequence, you get survival of the survivors. In other words, un the linked but unselected mutations get a free ride. They're present only because they're on the same genome as the particular mutation that's being selected for. So after a selection event, the product is a diverse population that shares only the selected mutations, the one that was important for survival, and all the other ones went along with it. They didn't really matter. Of course, they have to maintain a function of the genome, but there can be a wide range of changes associated with that, which is, of course, the nature of the quasi-species. So an example for, for illustrative purposes involves uh, HIV infection. At the end of stage of AIDS, which we'll talk about more detail at the end of this course, just before death, billions of virions are present in the infected individual, uh, and they engage the co-receptor known as CXCR4. To refresh your memories, uh, HIV, which is illustrated at the top, its glycoprotein, shown in green and yellow, engages CD4 receptor on the host cell, and one of two chemokine receptors, either CCR5 or CXCR4. So at the end stage of, age, of AIDS, most of the viruses that are replicating engage CXCR4. However, when these viruses are transmitted, the ones that infect a new host actually engage CCR5, the other chemokine co-receptor. So in other words, the viruses have passed through a bottleneck. Most of the viruses present engage CXCR4, but in fact, when those viruses replicate in the new individual, it's actually the ones that engage CCR5, which are present in the minority at end stage AIDS, which replicate initially. Viruses that devastate the immune system are not the most fit for infecting a new host. So the devastating infection caused by CXCR4 engaging viruses are not the ones that are best for transmission to a new host. And again, that the, the mutation that allows engagement of CCR5 is selected for during transmission, and that predominates. So diversity is also selected. Not only are individual mutations selected that are advantageous for the moment for the replication of the virus, but actual diversity itself, the ability to make mutations, is a selected trait. We know this because that we can select for mutations in viral nucleic acid polymerases that, in fact, reduce the frequency of incorporation errors. 
This has been done with RNA viruses. You can, for example, isolate single amino acid changes in the poliovirus RNA polymerase, which reduce its error rate. It's reduced the mutation frequency. These viruses with lower mutation rates do not have selective advantages in situations where they are mixed and asked to compete against the wild type virus. So they are not selected for. In nature, lower rates of mutation don't help you. They're not selected for. And if you put these viruses with lower mutation rates into animal models, they're often less pathogenic. So the, the conclusion is clearly that high mutation rates are selected for during virus evolution. Making mutations is clearly good for viral populations. So it's possible to make polymerases with higher fidelity rates, less mutation rates. These should have arisen in nature, but they're not. And the reason is they're, they're not advantageous at all for virus evolution. Another important concept in evolutionary theory is the error threshold. As we've just discussed, mutation rates are clearly important for virus evolvability, but there has to be a point at which the selection and advantage of being a high mutation rate is balanced by genetic fidelity. Okay, so you need mutation rates to be uh, evolutionarily competitive, but what's the upper limit of the mutation rate? Well, that limit is called the error threshold. If a viral genome exceeds the error threshold, in other words, makes more mutations than a certain level, and we'll talk about what that is in a moment, you lose infectivity. Uh, on the other hand, if, you, if a virus replicates below the error threshold, if it makes fewer mutations, compared to that threshold, it can't produce enough diversity to survive selection. So the threshold is a point above which it's lethal and below which uh, the virus isn't fit enough to evolve. And what we found is that RNA viruses tend to evolve close to their error threshold, while DNA viruses evolve far below it. This is a fundamental difference uh, between the two virus types. So let's talk about a couple of experiments to illustrate this principle. So first, let's take a, a cell culture infected with a DNA virus and expose it to a base analog like 5-azacytidine. So 5-aza-C is incorporated by the viral DNA polymerase as a C, but when it's then copied in the next round of polymerization, it's, it's recognized as a T. In other words, an A is put in instead of a G. So although it's a C, it's, it's actually azacytidine, so it's a, deriv a chemical derivative of C. It templates as a T, which results in mutations from G to A. All right, so you're treating this virus-infected culture with a mutagenic drug, essentially. You're increasing the mutation rate. And what you find by studying the progeny produced in this drug-treated culture is that the mutation rate increases by several orders of magnitude, by a hundred to a thousand fold. So that makes sense. You put in a mutagenic drug, you increase the mutation rate, and the key here is that it's very high increase, ten to a thousand, a hundred to a thousand fold. If you now do the same experiment with an RNA virus infected culture, you treat it with a chemical mutagen, the error frequency per genome increases only at best two to three times. You can't make any more mutations. The virus is existing at its error threshold. You can push it over it by including a mutagenic drug in an infected cell culture, but because the virus is so close to the error threshold already, you only get two to three times more mutants whereas the DNA virus is replicating far below the error threshold. Therefore, treating it with a mutagenic drug gives you hundreds to thousands of fold greater numbers of mutants. Okay, here's an experiment to show this graphically with an RNA virus. Here we are treating 
polio virus, which of course has an RNA virus, uh, an RNA genome, with the antiviral ribavirin. Now, ribavirin was used as an antiviral against many virus infections for many years. Its mechanism of action actually wasn't uh, well understood. In this experiment, we are treating uh, the virus infected cells with increasing amounts of the drug, starting from uh, no drug at the left to uh, a much more drug at the, all the way in the point on the right. And what we're measuring is RNA genome infectivity here on the y-axis and the number of mutations per genome on the x-axis. So you can see with no drug, we have every uh, we have high infectivity. That's the set point that's defined. No mutations per genome. And then with a small amount of, of drug, you have two mutations per genome, not much of a decrease. But then uh, with a little bit more drug, you have a drop, a, a huge drop in virus infectivity down to about 30% with just a few mutations per genome. And with about seven mutations per genome, we have almost no infectivity left. So you can see that the virus is existing very close to its error threshold because only a, a small number of mutations are needed to drastically inhibit its infectivity. Now just as a further illuminating result, it is possible to select mutants of poliovirus that are resistant to this antiviral drug. So it's easy to pass the virus in the presence of the drug. The virus, of course, makes a lot of mutants, and some of those are resistant to the drug. Where do you think the mutations are in the viral genome that confer resistance to ribavirin? Now what ribavirin is doing, it's pushing the virus over its error threshold. It's increasing the mutation rate. So in fact, these experiments revealed that in fact ribavirin worked as an antiviral because it pushes viruses over their error threshold. So the question is, where do you think the mutations are located in poliovirus selected for resistance to ribavirin? And if you guessed in the viral RNA polymerase, you'd be right. So these are mutations in the viral RNA polymerase that have an effect of making it less error prone. In fact, this is one of the pieces of evidence for the fact, for the conclusion that diversity itself, the ability to make mutations, is a trait that's selected by making viruses resistant to ribavirin. They were found to have less error-prone polymerases, but those viruses are less fit and less competitive and less pathogenic in animals. Another important concept is the genetic bottleneck. We already mentioned this when we discussed the fact that the HIV virions that are transmitted from a host are very different from the ones that are actually transmitted at the beginning of the next infection. A genetic bottleneck refers to extreme selective pressures on small populations that have effects like loss of diversity or accumulation of non-selected mutations. And again, non-selected mutations are those that go for a ride with the mutations that are selected for and under, under any given condition. And an experiment that we can do to illustrate a genetic bottleneck is as follows. We do a plaque assay of an RNA virus, and here's a, a plate on the bottom left full of plaques. We pick one of these plaques uh, and we expand the virus in cell culture and then we plaque it out again in another culture. We pick a plaque from the second plaque assay, we expand the virus and we do another plaque assay and pick a plaque and we do this over and over again many times. So we pick a plaque, grow up virus, plaque again, pick it again, etc. This results in a genetic bottleneck. After 20 to 30 cycles of this plaque to plaque amplification, uh, many viruses simply can't grow anymore. They're, they're less fit than the original population. But why has this happened? The environment's exactly the same. We're doing plaque-to-plaque -plaque passage within the same cells, the same conditions, 
the only selection is making a plaque. So how could that make uh, the virus fitness re go down dramatically? Well, the answer is we've put the viruses through a genetic bottleneck. And that bottleneck arises because we've restricted replication to the viruses that are in a single plaque. So that's the key here. The diversity is very low. A single plaque contains at best a few thousand viruses. And remember, a plaque is derived from a single founder virus. So one virus forms a plaque and a few thousand viruses is not enough diversity to ensure population stability. So here's a nice graphic illustration of a bottleneck. You have your original virus population quite diverse as defined by the quasi-species in the bottle. And then when we pour the contents into a container, the bottle by definition has a bottleneck and only a few viruses can get through. So the surviving individuals are low diversity. So it's that very low diversity population that we use to make the next generation. And doing this over and over restricts the diversity and that's why we have uh, a reduction in fitness. Now why this happens? is due to a phenomenon called Muller's ratchet. And that is, uh, this was defined by a geneticist a number of years ago, and the, the ratchet says small asexual populations decline in fitness over time if the mutation rate is high. And this applies to RNA viruses. They make many mutations, they survive close to their error threshold, so the mutation rate is high. We restrict the replication to serial single founders, that is single viruses forming a plaque, and that's the bottleneck. Other, there doesn't seem to be any other selective conditions except imposing this bottleneck. And basically we make a very low diversity population, we get lots of mutations accumulating and fitness decreases because we essentially exceed uh, the error threshold. So the ratchet metaphor refers to the fact that every new mutation that's accumulating in the genome acts like a ratchet. It lets the gear move forward, but not backwards. So you add a mutation, it's always there in the genome. You add a second one, it's always present. And eventually, as each round works like a ratchet, mutations accumulate until you exceed the error threshold. So this is illustrated in this uh, slide. On the left is our initial population of viruses. It's a quasi-species where every genome is different. If we were to take the entire population and infect a new cell culture, uh, we would select, the basis for selection would be the entire population. And so we would see changes depending on the selection pressures that we impose. And in the end, we would have better fitness under those conditions. So if you imposed high temperature, for example, you would select viruses that are able to grow at high temperature, and these viruses would be fit because they would be derived from the entire diverse population. When you do a plaque assay, you now pick a single virus. So here now, we're picking the virus with two stars and a triangle mutation, and we expand that virus by picking the plaque and and expanding it in cell culture. So now all the progeny will have the two stars and the triangle, and of course they will accumulate other mutations as well. But now you see this, this population is very different from the initial one. It's far less diverse, and in addition, uh, these mutations are present in all the genomes. And if you repeat this over and over, selecting again uh, by plaque assay, you can see that you are working with a less diverse population. Initially, you're accumulating mutation in that less diverse population, and as a consequence, you exceed the error threshold and fitness declines. So here are some real-world examples of bottlenecks uh, by plaque assay procedures that we've just talked about, Phi-6, a bacteriophage, after 40 bottleneck passages, again, plaque to plaque, the, you have a 22% decrease in fitness. VSV, 20 passages, 18%. Foot and mouth disease virus, a coronavirus, 30 passages, 60% decrease. HIV, 
bottleneck passages 94 percent decrease and, and another phage 20 passages 17 percent so these are all examples of taking a virus and passing it from plaque to plaque and getting a reduction in fitness as a consequence of passing through the bottleneck now in the real world do we ever have bottlenecks or is this something totally artificial and restricted to plaque assays in the laboratory well it does happen in the real world there are cases where you have infections by a small virus population uh, for example during aerosol transmission of respiratory viruses the small droplets do not contain the full diversity of virus populations uh, activation of latent viruses from a limited population of cells. You remember when we talked about herpes simplex virus latency in neurons. A few neurons in peripheral ganglia contain single genomes. And then these, when they reactivate, they give rise to virus particles. But the starting material is a sim single genome. So there is a bottleneck there. Insect bites can also be bottlenecks. They deliver a small volume of inoculum with very few virus particles. So there's plenty of opportunity for bottlenecks uh, in the real world, yet they don't often result in a restriction. Uh, and that is because there are ways to avoid Muller's ratchet in the real world. So basically, if you are doing this in the laboratory, you could avoid the ratchet by instead of picking a single plaque to pool several plaques before passaging. So in this experiment, we've done a plaque assay. We pick a couple of plaques, we pool them, amplify, and then do a new plaque assay. We won't have a, a bottleneck if we do that. That's because we have more diversity in the replicating population. We've started with a couple of plaques more, instead of one. Therefore, you can reconstruct wild-type viruses by recombination or reassortment or removing gr mutations that affect growth adversely. So here's an example of how recombination can help overcome Muller's ratchet. Let's say we have two viruses produced by uh, low passage, low multiplicity infections, and they're both of reduced fitness and they have mutations in different parts of the genome. Recombination can take place between these two viral genomes to, to yield one which is free of either deleterious mutation. So recombination can help rescue the defects imposed by Muller's ratchet. Of course, there has to, again, be enough diversity in the population to achieve this. If these viruses had multiple mutations in the genome, it wouldn't be possible to reconstruct a healthy recombinant by recombination. So basically, to avoid the ratchet, recombination gives you a powerful selection. And that recombinant virus that we just described will take over the population. So again, diversity of the population is important for the survival of individual members. The population needs to be diverse, but what might emerge in the end is a single recombinant virus that has survived because of the population diversity. And again, you remove the diversity by passing the virus through a bottleneck and the entire population suffers. Exchange of genetic information, to summarize, this allows the construction of infectious genomes and avoids the ratchet. This we illustrated using recombination. But reassortment can also avoid the ratchet. This, of course, happens in cells co-infected with viruses with segmented genomes, such as uh, influenza viruses and rheoviruses. So this is an important source of variation, reassortment and recombination to avoid uh, the restrictions imposed by bottlenecks. Genetic drift and shift are actually a very real phenomena during uh, viral epidemics. And these are ways that viruses overcome uh, limited genetic diversity. So when viruses replicate in immunocompetent individuals, we make antibody and T cell responses. These apply pressure uh, to the viral genomes, and it, they select for viruses that are already present in the, the, the diverse population that can avoid the antibody or the cytotoxic T cells. And we define 
two terms here that are important to remember. One is antigenic drift. This is diversity that arises from uh, copying errors in the polymerase and the subsequent selection by the immune response, either antibodies or T cells. And genetic shift is the diversity that arises after recombination or reassortment. Again, these mechanisms are imposed by selection pressures, and here we're using the antibody response to illustrate those kinds of pressures. Influenza viruses are the masters of antigenic drift and shift. We've discussed these quite a bit so far in this course, but to remind you, they are enveloped RNA viruses with a segmented genome, and the two main glycoproteins in the envelope are called the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. They're shown in blue and red, respectively, in this illustration. And these viruses are categorized according to the sequence of the HA and the NA proteins on the surface. And this is how we name influenza viruses. We give numbers to the H and the N, uh, and so depending on the typing of each protein, we call them HXNY, or H1N1, for example, H3N2, and so forth. So far, we've discovered 18 different HA types and 11 different neuraminidase types. And we know that at least 17 of those HAs can infect birds, or I should say viruses with those HA molecules can infect birds but only H1, H2, and H3 types can infect and transmit between humans. Absent from here is H5, which are avian influenza hemagglutinins. These infect humans, but they don't transmit effectively between them. Only the H1, H2, and H3 hemagglutinins can do that. This is an illustration of how reassortment provides diversity for influenza virus and is selected for by the immune response. Over time in human history, there have been uh, a number of so-called pandemics of influenza virus infection. These are global ep epidemics where millions and millions of individuals are infected. And we think these have, we, we can have, we have evidence that these uh, started in 1889. It's likely that they began well before that, but we simply don't have any evidence for it. But let's start with the 1918 virus, uh, which we've discussed briefly because we talked about experiments in which its genome was reconstructed from uh, patients. This virus is believed to have originated from an avian influenza virus uh, that entered humans, causing this pandemic. This virus, which is an H1N1 virus, became adapted to humans and circulated in the human population until 1957, causing annual outbreaks of influenza known as epidemics, but certainly not the pandemic disease that was present in 1918. In 1957, by 1957, of course, a good fraction of the human population was now immune to the 1918 virus. That pressure, that antibody, immune pressure selected for the emergence of a reassortant virus, which was the H2N2 virus in 1957, and this caused a new pandemic of influenza. So again, the virus was brand new to the human population. It hadn't been seen before, and therefore it caused a global outbreak. This virus is a reassortant of the 1918 strain and an H2N2 virus that was circulating in birds. And you can see that the 1957 H2N2 strain derives two, three genes from the avian strain, the PB1, the HA, and the NA gene, and all the rest of the genes come from the 1918 strain. So the HA and the NA being derived from the duck H2N2 virus gives this 1957 human strain its antigenic characteristics. That's why we call it H2N2, because this is an H2HA from the duck and an N2NA from the duck as well. Again, the human population had no antibodies to this virus. It therefore caused the pandemic and supplanted the 1918 strain. That virus circulated until 1968 when it was replaced by an H3N2 strain. Again, it's, this is a reassortant of the previous two strains and derives the HA and the PB1 genes from another duck virus. 
and the presence of that new HA again made this able to spread globally and cause a pandemic because humans did not have antibodies to the H3 hemagglutinin. So this can be traced every time there is a new uh, pandemic of influenza. Reassortants arise that give rise to new viruses that are not recognized by the human antibody response. And the source of these new strains, in particular the antigenic components, the HA and the NA, are influenza viruses circulating in ducts. Now our most recent pandemic occurred in 2009 when a novel H1N1 virus emerged in humans, spread globally, uh, causing a pandemic. Enough of the population didn't have antibodies to uh, this virus and therefore it was able to circulate freely. Interestingly, anyone who had survived the 1918 influenza pandemic was largely immune to infection with this virus because the HA uh, from, of this virus was ultimately derived from the HA of a swine influenza virus and these viruses have been circulating in pigs relatively unchanged since 1918. So very little antigenic variation in pigs, which is in contrast to what occurs in humans. Uh, this 2009 H1N1 virus is a reassortant derived from many different ancestors, including an avian virus, uh, the H3N2 human virus that had been circulating, the, the swine H1N1, which I said had been circulating since 1918 uh, in those animals, and a different swine viruses circulating in Eurasian swine. So all of these contributed genes to the 2009 pandemic strain and there is, was also an intermediate reassortant step uh, where genes were from North American swine influenza viruses were donated to this virus. So all of these reassortants occurring in nature uh, reassortants between bird and swine influenza viruses and human strains and eventually one emerged that was able to escape immune selection pressures and this then predominated in the population and it continues to circulate today. So a great example of how reassortant can provide uh, the genetic variation that's needed to escape the selection pressure of the immune response. Now the other kind of variation that occurs in influenza virus is antigenic drift. And we've discussed this briefly before as well. The HA protein from year to year undergoes mutation and the resulting amino acid changes in the HA can be selected by our antibody response. So the HA polypeptide shown in blue on the virion is expanded on the right in its three-dimensional form. And remember, this is a stalk-like molecule. The base here would be embedded in the viral membrane. The tip contains the sialic acid binding site. And all these colored regions are areas in the HA in which single amino acid changes have been known to occur that can interfere with the binding of antibodies. So as this virus replicates in hosts, the mutations caused by the RNA polymerase are incorporated into the HA polypeptide. And if the mutation is in one of these sites, if the amino acid changes in one of these sites, can lead to antibody escape. Those viruses will be selected for in a host. They are transmitted to new hosts uh, and they give rise to variants that necessitate us to change the, the vaccine uh, every year or every several years. So that's antigenic drift. A very different mechanism occurs by the error-prone RNA polymerase of the virus uh, leading to amino acid changes in the antigenic epitopes of the HA protein. In the wild, we see also exchange of genetic information in animal viruses, and presumably this also allows for the emergence of viruses that escape some kind of selection pressure. The, viruses, the virus being illustrated here is an RNA virus called bovine viral diarrhea virus. There is a strain of the virus that circulates in animals, uh, which is non-cytopathic, it doesn't cause disease, but a number of strains have emerged in, in cattle that do cause disease. They become cytopathic. They do cause a diarrheal disease in animals. And these are viruses that have acquired additional sequences by RNA recombination. 
and in particular the inserted sequence is a cellular RNA sequence that encodes a protein which is a substrate for a cellular protease, the ubiquitin cleavage site. And the result is that you now have new cleavage sites within different parts of this polyprotein which are associated with virulence. So again, these recombinants arise randomly during virus replication. They're present in the viruses and when there is selection for the, the presence, say in this case, of an additional protease cleavage site, uh, these viruses are selected for it and they also are more virulent. Now why these would be selected for isn't really clear, but the principle here is that recombination can provide new avenues for selection and in this case the recombination added a cellular sequence to the viral genome. This brings us to a very interesting question, which is, is virulence a positively or negatively selected trait? So let's frame this in a simple way. The idea, one idea would be that increased virulence of a virus would reduce its transmissibility. You kill the host faster, therefore you reduce the ability of the infected host to contact uninfected hosts, transmission decreases, uh, and therefore the virus is, is not positively selected because this virus isn't transmitted well. If this were true, and this is just a theoretical construct, if this were true, then all viruses should evolve to be as infectious as possible, but not virulent. So that infectious as possible, so they could be transmitted in efficiently, but not virulent because if they became virulent, this would inhibit transmission. However, this is not what we observe when we look at all the virus infections that are out there. For example, we can describe persistent infections where the, the virus is present for years. It's effectively transmitted to other hosts when the virus is reactivated, such as the herpes viruses do so well, but then at end stage disease, they, could, they can kill the host. Another nice example is the fact that some viruses are virulent in one species, but maintained as asymptomatic infections in another. So there's no difference in, uh, there's a great difference in whether the virus is virulent, but it's in both cases has survived. It has remained transmissible even as a virulent virus in one species. And in another species, it's asymptomatic, yet uh, both, both patterns exist. For some diseases, it's quite clear that increased virulence increases transmissibility, or at least the two traits are associated for, and that is selected for in natural infections. For example, you can imagine that a virus evolves to induce more serious cough and sneeze or other respiratory responses because that facilitates transmission. So it's reflected as an increased uh, virulence. So here's an experiment that was done with rabbits in the wild that illustrates uh, some of these concepts. And this began in 1859 when the European rabbit was introduced to Australia for hunting purposes. So. Uh, it was brought there so it would multiply and uh, hunters could, could get them. However, it reproduced to huge numbers in a very short time because there were no predators. And this is a, a, a good example of how disturbing a natural system can result in problems. So there are too many rabbits in Australia. They sought a problem to get around this. What the Australians decided was to release a virus called Leporipox virus, which is a member of the pox virus family, to try and get rid of the European rabbits. The natural host of this virus is uh, other rabbit species um, where, uh, and they're not always present in Australia, of course, uh, but not the European rabbit. The European rabbit is killed by these infections 90 to 90% mortality rate, whereas infection of these other rabbit species uh, are, are, is not as lethal. Viruses spread from rabbit to rabbit by mosquitoes, uh, and the infected rabbits, in this case, the cottontail, brush rabbit, etc., they develop warts on their ears that spread from one animal to another. 
But as I said, the European rabbits are killed by the virus. So the virus was released into the wild. In the first year, the mortality rate was 99.8%. By the second year, that had dropped to 25%. And in subsequent years, uh, the rate the, of killing by the virus was lower than the reproductive capacity. So it was not possible to eradicate uh, the, the rabbits with this, with this approach. Now, even 25 to 30 to 40 percent mortality rate is, is a high mortality rate for any virus. But the point here is that it was no longer 100 percent or close to 100 percent after that first year. The virus evolved to a lower mortality rate. And we have to ask ourselves whether that was because uh, the virus would be more effectively spread in that way. So the key here is that both rabbits and viruses make a lot of offspring. Viruses many more, of course, but rabbits have a high capacity to reproduce. And therefore, a single rabbit that is more resistant to infection will quickly uh, dominate the population because it will survive infections. In turn, the virus uh, evolved to kill fewer rabbits. And that means the infected rabbits live longer. The virus can last over the winter, winter and spread in the spring by mosquito bites. So the virus evolves, the rabbits evolve to become more resistant. This is, a, this is how we would predict a evolving host parasite interaction would come to equilibrium. And we'll talk more about this next time when we talk about emergence. This actually leads to a, an interesting question, which is why do viruses cause disease at all? Why aren't they a virulent and highly transmissible? And as I said, this is not what we observe. So why is it? Why is there still virulence among isolates? Uh, one, one idea that's attractive is that virulence may be an accidental trait. For example, high levels of virus replication are likely to be needed for transmission. And so perhaps as viruses evolve to replicate to high levels, they collaterally uh, kill the host as a consequence. I'm not sure that this is universally true. It may be true in some cases. And in fact, we're probably looking at a question here that has multiple answers. But if you compare polio and norovirus, you see that this statement that high levels of replication are needed is probably not true. Both viruses infect the enteric tract. They replicate to very high levels in the intestine. They're shed in the feces. Both viruses are transmitted very effectively among hosts, yet polioviruses cause no pathology in the gut tract, no gastroenteritis, no diarrhea, and noroviruses cause gastroenteritis and diarrhea in, in nearly every infected host. So there is a very big difference in the disease, yet the transmission in both cases is effective and the replication rates are, are both high. So why one is pathogenic versus the other isn't quite known. One answer may lie in the fact that uh, viruses all need to encode proteins to evade or modulate host immune defenses. And it may be that in the case of norovirus, those immune evasion proteins have a side effect of causing gastroenteritis. We don't have evidence that that's the case, but it's theoretically possible. In, uh, in bacteria, there are interesting examples of how virulence uh, is in fact collateral damage. And I, I suggest you have a look at a post I wrote on this uh, a short time ago called Why Do Viruses Cause Disease? There are two examples of bacteria where it's been shown that uh, e evolution of bacteria to other properties has led to them acquiring virulence. So virulence is accidental. Remember that there are determinants of virulence in the host as well. And we talked about this for herpes simplex encephalitis. Herpes simplex is not virulent in the CNS of most individuals, but in people with mutations in immune defense genes, then the virus uh, can make, it, make its way to the CNS where it causes lethal encephalitis. So host genes can also play a role in whether or not viruses are virulent uh, as well. And I think we're in very early days with these sorts of questions. The ability to sequence genomes is going to provide uh, more information on this question.
I want to end up this this session today with talking about where viruses came from, the origin of viruses. And this is a very interesting area for which uh, we don't have a lot of data because, of course, we don't have fossils of viruses uh, like we do for uh, animals. But there are fossils of their own sort, which we'll talk about in a moment. There are those who believe uh, that, in fact, virus-like elements preceded cellular life. So I've listed here three different theories for the origins of viruses. And one of them is that in the primordial soup that existed on Earth, the organic soup that existed billions of years ago, nucleic acids evolved that could replicate. And these are virus-like elements that eventually, that eventually gave rise to cells and parasitic viruses. A really interesting take on the fact that all cellular life may be derived from viruses. Another th line of thought posits that viruses arose from cells. They broke away from cells carrying enough genes uh, to replicate and then slowly lost those genes as they parasitized the cells of their origin uh, and then eventually became uh, obligate intracellular parasites requiring the cell for their replication. And that we call reductive evolution. They lose genes from the point at which they left the cell. Another idea is that viruses arose from cells as minimal replicative elements, parasitic, and then gained the genes that they needed to explore and adapt into other niches. And this is the pickpocket hypothesis where viruses are believed to have stolen genes from other viruses and cells as well. Now, I, I mentioned that there's no fossil record in the sense that we have physical uh, evidence for viruses of any given age. The, the viral stocks that we have aren't very old. So I, I've written here, a few stocks are more than 80 years old. The 1918 influenza virus was, for a long time, the oldest uh, viral virus that had been ever obtained. This was uh, recovered from individuals who had been buried in 1918 and preserved, and the virus was regenerated from sequence derived from that material. Very recently, a virus was recovered from 35,000-year-old permafrost in Siberia, and this was one of the giant viruses that infect amoeba. The virus is called Pithovirus uh, Sibiricus, Sibiricum. That is clearly the oldest virus we have. It was clearly retained infectious in the frozen material for 35,000 years, uh, and we can now study it today. And, e and even more recently, uh, an RNA virus of, of plants was identified in very old samples of wheat, and it's believed to be at least 750 years old. But these are only a handful of examples of very old viruses. It doesn't allow us to look back in time and really understand where viruses came from. However, we do have other kinds of fossils in the form of viral nucleic acids integrated into cellular genomes. And the field of bioinformatics has provided a great deal of insight about the origin of viruses by looking at these integrated viral sequences in different species and analyzing mutation rates. Now, very large viral DNA genomes have recently been identified, as we've talked about a few times in this course. Uh, we've talked about the Mimi viruses, shown at the bottom illustration here, which were much bigger than any known virus at the time of their discovery, uh, with genomes of 1.2 million base pairs. The Pandora viruses subsequently discovered, uh, shown here on the lower right, two and a half million, uh, million base pair genomes. And of course, the uh, pithovirus, which I just mentioned, with, with also a very large genome. The interesting thing, uh, aspect of, of these viral genomes is that they are largely dark matter. Dark matter means we have a sequence and we don't recognize it at all. It's nothing related to any other nucleotide sequence, whether viral or cellular, that we have ever seen. Ever seen. Originally, when the Mimi viruses were discovered and this large amount of dark matter in the genome, over 90% of the genome is dark matter, uh, 
it was suggested that these viruses might be derived from a fourth domain of life, in addition to bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. A fourth domain of life may have given rise to these viruses, which is now extinct. With the discovery of other large viruses like megaviruses, Pandora viruses, and pithoviruses, it became clear that this was not likely the case because each of those had their own dark matter, which was unrelated to the dark matter of the other viruses. And it simply couldn't be that there were so many extinct domains of life, or at least it wasn't likely. It now seems clear that uh, a good deal of these genomes are in fact related and can be related to eukaryotes. So for example, the DNA polymerase genes of these viruses are all distantly related uh, and are clearly of eukaryotic origin. So I think it, it seems likely that many of these viruses are quite ancient, have been evolving for a good number of years, and have simply evolved to the point where we don't recognize them any longer. I, I recommend that you listen to two of the podcasts we've done if you're really interested in learning more. Uh, we've had conversations with some of the individuals who are involved in these fields. Uh, in Giants Among Viruses, we talked with some of the co-discoverers of Mimi, uh, Pandora, and Pithoviruses, and their ideas about a fourth domain of life. And th their thought that viruses began large and lost genes. And they believe that these large DNA viruses are intermediates in the gene loss of these viruses. On the other hand, if you listen to our talk with Eugene Koonin, uh, he believes that uh, viruses also started small and acquired genes. Uh, and he's also a believer that virus-like elements are precursors of all cellular life. So they have distinctly opposing viewpoints, which is interesting to tease out among these two discussions. I think the, the bottom line is that it's clear that probably multiple mechanisms have can be used to explain the origin uh, of DNA and RNA viruses as well. We've also been able to look at sequences of different viruses, calculate uh, a mutation rate, and then place these viruses at different points in time. So for example, by looking at herpes viral genome evolution and comparing that with the evolution of the hosts, you can pinpoint the fact that these viruses were probably present at least 180 to 220 million years ago, uh, which would place them among the dinosaurs here. Not too long ago in terms of geologic time on Earth, which goes back 4.5 billions of years. But it's interesting to know that these viruses were uh, causing uh, infections a long time ago. Endogenous viruses have provided a great deal of information about the origins of viruses. And these are from genomes of retroviruses and other viruses as well. We've talked about endogenous retroviruses in this course. These are proviruses inserted into the germline of animals. With DNA sequencing becoming very easy, we can sequence genomes of different animals that are phylogenetically related and we can compare the DNA mutation rate of the provirus in the genome and calculate uh, when it entered the genome. We can also use phylogenomics to estimate when the retrovirus inserted into the genome. So for example, here is a phylogenetic tree of a variety of vertebrates, uh, of, uh, starting from humans, uh, going to the reptiles, and these, of course, uh, for many of these, we have sequences of the genomes, we have sequences of the endogenous retroviruses. So we can estimate, for example, when a particular retrovirus went into its genetic locus by seeing, looking back on the phylogenetic tree and seeing the last point uh, at the branch point when, when the gene was, when the retroviral gene was inserted. So for example, we can determine by this kind of analysis that the HERV-H endogenous retrovirus of humans uh, entered the genome about 25 million years ago, which would, of course, place it in uh, the ancestors of humans. In addition to retroviruses being present in the genome, there are also sequences integrated of other viral genomes. We call these endogenous because they are in the germline, 
But these are accidental. These are not part of the life cycle of the virus, as is the case for retroviruses. We can find sequences of influenza viruses, bornaviruses, rheoviruses, hepatitis B viruses, and many more in the genomes of various animals. These are typically fragments of the genome. They're not functional. They probably entered accidentally as nucleic acid entered the nucleus, but they do provide markers of when these viruses existed because, again, we can look at a phylogenetic tree and see how far back these insertions were present. So, for example, we can gauge that hepatitis B viruses have been around at least for 190 million years or so. So we can get a lot of information from genome sequencing and looking at the markers that these viral integrations provide. Now, we'll talk a, a lot more about the emergence of human viruses, that is, viruses that infect people, in the next lecture. But I just want to leave you with a few thoughts here. Uh, first, I think that all the viruses that infect us at the moment uh, are probably evolved from animal viruses. All the types of viruses that infect us, from DNA to RNA viruses of different genome types, of the seven different genome types, these all evolved long before humans appeared on Earth. Uh, so it's likely that they were present before we were here and that uh, all the viruses that infect us today come from animal viruses. So a couple of examples of this, and again, there'll be many more examples next time. S smallpox virus, if, if you look at the sequences of 45 different isolates, they can be organized into cluster, geographic clusters in West Africa, South America, and Asia. A comparison of those sequences shows they all have the same number of genes, uh, and there's a lack of diversity which is consistent with a recent introduction into people. The longer a virus has replicated in the species, the longer uh, diverse there, the more diversity there is going to be as as the species move to different environments and exert different selection pressures on the virus. So recent introduction into humans, there is one member of this family that has good homology with smallpox virus, and that is a gerbil pox virus. So one theory is that smallpox of humans is actually a zoonotic infection that went from a virus that went from uh, gerbils to people some time ago. Measles virus has a similar origin. Measles virus is highly related to rinderpest virus, which infects cows. And we believe that measles evolved from rinderpest when humans first began to domesticate cattle. So we first learned at some point that we could have animals uh, to supply our protein needs. We began to grow them on farms in close proximity to people. These were, uh, again, animals that existed previously in the wild. They had their own infections. And as they began to be cultivated near humans, they gave us their viruses. And we think that for measles, it, arised, it arose from a zoonotic infection from uh, cows to humans. And as cities begin to grow, 5,000 years ago in the Middle East, people began to congregate on cities. The virus entered cities as animals or infected humans were brought into these areas and then established itself as a human pathogen. This virus was uh, established in uh, the Middle East, eventually spread to Europe. And then as Europeans began to travel to North and South America, they brought measles virus with them and it reached the Americas in the 16th century where it destroyed Native Americans, uh, as did smallpox. So the history of uh, human infections is not only one of viruses acquired from our uh, antecedents, our evolutionary precursors, uh, and the wild animals that they encountered, but also by farm animals that we have lived close to uh, for many years. Let's look a little bit into the future of virus evolution. Let's make the assumption that new viruses only arise from viruses that are here now. There aren't going to be any brand new viruses arising. We have the seven genome types, we have protein capsids, we have envelope viruses of different configurations. Let's assume that all new viruses that are evolving are going to come from these. So 
what exactly is that mutation landscape? What are the possibilities? What are the number of all possible mutations? Sequence comparisons of RNA viruses have shown that in some cases over half of the bases in a genome can accommodate mutations. So if you have a 7,000 base RNA genome, over 3,500 bases can be changed and that is still compatible with virus replication. So if we do some math, take a 10 kilobase viral genome, there are 4 to the 5,000 power of different genome sequences. 4 to the 5,000. This is a huge number. And half of that, or over half of that, could lead to viable viruses. If you add in deletions, recombination, reassortment, the number would even get bigger. This is way bigger than all the viruses on the planet. And it is amazingly big because there are only four to the 135 atoms uh, in the visible universe. So there's a lot of potential for virus evolution, probably impossible to predict. Uh, all we can say is that it will continue and there will always be selection forces to act upon them. There are restrictions to where viruses can go and they are constrained by their fundamental properties. So for example, no matter how much mutation and selection occurs, we always can recognize a herpes virus or an influenza virus or any other virus by simply looking at its genome. Viruses have to work within master or consensus sequences and that's clearly been observable at least in contemporary evolution. As I mentioned earlier, some of the dark matter of DNA viruses seems to be a material that has mutated to the point where we don't recognize it, but it would be interesting to know if, if this has resulted in any major changes of, uh, of the virus structure. So we think that virus evolution has to result in stability of, of the virion, and that's because there are fundamental characteristics that define every influenza and every herpes viruses. They have to function within these constraints. So what are these constraints? Well, the, the viral genome is one. DNA can't become RNA or vice versa as far as we can tell because you have totally different proteins involved in replicating those genomes and too much would have to change at once to facilitate that. The replication strategy involves interaction with other viral and host proteins, so that's not likely to change either. The physical nature of the capsid Icosahedral capsids defines the genome size, so huge fluctuations can't occur. It couldn't go from an icosahedral to an envelope virion. That would require glycoproteins that are not present. So the, what a virus is, is, is constraining its, rev, its evolution. So the four to the 5,000 possible genomes is vastly restricted because DNA has to remain DNA and icosahedral capsids have to remain icosahedral capsids. During infection, um, there is also a constraint. Mutants too efficient in bypassing host defenses will kill the host and not be transmitted well. There has to be a, a, a medium or a point at which uh, replication and killing the host is balanced. So this is perhaps one of the constants that we can predict from evolution is that the virus has to replicate within the framework that it exists. So let's, let's end with this slide which is food for thought and it brings up a remarkable uh, set of facts. As you may know, uh, human, the human genome is 98% chimpanzee and it took about 8 million years for humans to evolve from their prosimian uh, antecedents or precursors, as shown here, eight million years for the genome to change 2%. When poliovirus uh, infects a human, in the time it takes to go from the mouth to being excreted in the feces, about five days, the virus changes its genome by 2%. So 2% here, eight million years, 2% here, five days. Imagine what a virus can do with 8 million years.